Hello, and welcome to Distant Echoes, New Mexico Episode 8, Go West, Lost Man. Last time we left Cabeza de Vaca, Alonso de Castillo, Andreas Dorantes, and Esteban preparing to continue moving west, just after leaving one of the groups they had been staying with. They had deliberated for a short period of time about which way to go. They could travel south along the coast and, presumably, arrive in Spanish-controlled territory much more quickly. But they had found that the locals along the coast to be much less friendly than those they had found inland. Thus, the decision was made to continue moving west and heading inland before finding a convenient place to cut south and continue on into Spanish territory. Presumably, to Devaca and his companions, all of the other members of the expedition had perished at this point. They then spent another eight months with a different group. Devaca describes how hungry they were during this time. Quote, Among them we underwent fiercer hunger than among the Adavares. End quote. The Adavares being the last group they had stayed with. Quote, We ate not more than two handfuls of prickly pears a day and they were still so green and milky they burned our mouths. In our lack of water, eating brought great thirst. At nearly the end of our endurance, we bought two dogs for some nets, with other things, and a skin I used for cover. End quote. Another note, the Spanish at this time called prickly pear fruit tunas, which I just thought was interesting. The dogs were swiftly eaten to help restore their strength before they left for the next group. On this journey, they got so hungry they had to eat cactus pads. From this next group, they continued on to Big Springs, Texas, before continuing to move inland from group to group until they could see mountains. During one of these changes, they encountered women with cornmeal, probably from the Pueblos, far to the north. At this point, they had started to build a small group of followers that accompanied them to the next village to get gifts, and then would head home, and a new group would do the same to the next village. They crossed the Pecos River, possibly somewhere near Carlsbad, and Dorantes was giving a capa rattle. They continued through the mountains and into the foothills. Devaca comments on how little food and water there was. With one group, they stayed for half a month due to an ongoing war with the next group. This was approximately sometime in late October 1535. Castillo and Esteban were taken to see what they were told was a permanent village somewhere near El Paso. Modern research does not believe this to have been a truly sedentary settlement. They were taken there by two women, one a captive from the village. Quote, the captive one led them to a river which ran between the mountains, where her father's town lay. The dwellings of this town were the first to be seen which looked like real houses. End quote. At this stop, they heard of the Pueblos. They wanted to see them, but were told the route was dangerous, so they did not go that far north. Instead, they cut west near Rincon, New Mexico, and continued across Arizona down to Sonora, staying with several groups along the way. Here they are given probably the strangest items that Cabeza de Vaca talks about, several emerald arrowheads although most likely they were actually Malachite arrowheads. Quote, We marched more than a hundred leagues through continuously inhabited country of such domiciles, where corn and beans remained plentiful. People gave us innumerable deer hides and cotton blankets, the latter the better than those of New Spain, beads made of coral from the South Sea, fine turquoise from the North. In fact, everything they had, including a special gift to me of five emerald arrowheads, such as they use in their singing and dancing, These looked quite valuable. I asked where they came from. They said lofty mountains to the north, where there were towns of great population and great houses, and that the arrowheads had been purchased with feather bushes and parrot plumes. New Spain in this case is what the Spanish called Spanish Mexico during this period. There's also some confusion about who actually received the arrowheads and how many there were. The joint report written by Cabeza de Vaca, Castillo, and Dorantes has them being given to Dorantes instead of Cabeza de Vaca, as well as the number being slightly different at 7 instead of 5. They then continued onwards. However, rain slowed their progress. Here they celebrated Christmas, even though it was probably sometime in January 1536. At the next stop, they noticed a man with a sword belt buckle and a horseshoe nail around his neck. This is where they heard about Europeans and picked up the pace. They stopped at what would become a major stopping point of other Spanish expeditions known as Corazones, named after the innumerable deer hearts they ate while there. As they continued, they traveled through areas devastated by Spanish slave hunters and noted the signs of precious metals. At one point, they spot Europeans and their escort nearly dissolves. They find a recent European camp and Cabeza de Vaca tries to set up one last rally to go. Only Esteban and some of their escorts volunteered to accompany him. They finally meet the Spanish and are taken to meet Diego de Alcaraz, who notes that he was having trouble capturing the natives to make slaves. Cabeza de Vaca tells him where Castillo and Dorantes were. Men are sent to get them, and Esteban goes back as a guide. And Devaco learns that it is March 1536. The exact day in March is not recorded. After the rest are brought in, 
An argument breaks out between the group and the slavers who want to, well, enslave the natives accompanying the survivors. This is when the emerald arrowheads are lost or forgotten. The group of Indians escorting the survivors refused, at first, to leave the four in the hands of the Spanish, thinking about how harshly the Spanish had treated them. However, they were eventually convinced to do so, and they established a colony at Bamoa. Meanwhile, Davaco is arrested and taken to Alcalde Mayor Melchior Diaz. Most likely, they had been arrested to keep rumors from spreading as the Spanish tried to control its expansion of the colonies, rather than actually being arrested for some perceived crime. Diaz had heard of the expedition, and by this point everyone assumed that the land portion was dead, and he rushed out to greet the survivors. During the march, they were asked to get the natives from the area to re-establish their villages, which they did before they continued on to Mexico City, arriving on July 4th, where they would go to their separate ways. Here's where I'll mark the end of Cabeza de Vaca's odyssey. We'll spend the rest of this episode rounding out what happens to those who survive. We'll start with the group that had remained at sea. They had failed to find the harbor, but had found the bay where the Spanish had burned the boxes before returning. Supposedly, the women that had been left behind on the ships told all of the people on the ships that they would never see their husbands again and should take new ones, an act they did. The barge and other ship from Cuba spent one year looking for the expedition before giving up. One of the men on the ships would end up being captured, and would later be found by the De Soto expedition, after he had integrated into the tribe that had captured him. Diaz and Alcaraz, while only appearing at the end of our story, would go on to join Coronado on his great exploration of the plains in New Mexico, where both would end up perishing. There are several major questions that Devaca leaves unanswered in his account that I want to address here. Some would be answered by later expeditions, and others are still subject to debate. The first question was simply this, if Cabeza de Vaca and others had survived, why not others? Had one of the other survivors perhaps even established a Christian kingdom somewhere in the Tierra Nueva, as the land to the north of Spanish colonies was beginning to be called? This is reminiscent of Prester John's stories that, these, that were popular in Christian Europe at the time. Later expeditions would certainly ask this question of later stories they heard. Another question was what had been missed. Cabeza de Vaca had heard about great cities to the north of where he traveled, but he had not seen them himself. Could these be the great cities of China, or maybe India, centers of much wealth of a large population? Perhaps they were further outlying civilizations for an enterprising conquistador to turn into encomiendas, so they could live the easy life. The encomienda system is something we will discuss a lot in coming episodes. It would not be until near the end of the 16th century that the Spanish would have a better understanding that they were not in Asia anymore, and instead had discovered an entirely new world. While they did know the size of the Pacific due to some shipping expeditions by the Portuguese, they really didn't have a good understanding of the actual size and shape of the Americas yet. The other question I want to talk about is something that plagues most of the other accounts of Spanish expeditions to the north, how they treated the Amerindian tribes they met. Cabeza de Vaca relates that the tribes on the coast were unfriendly, if not outright hostile to the Spanish they encountered. Some of the tribes early on are hostile for unknown reasons. One suggestion I'd like to posit is that the Spanish weren't exactly being fair. They may have stolen from these people, like the one group that was hostile with no reason given back in episode 7. Maybe some of these groups on the coast had been harassed by marauding Spaniards before the Narvaez expedition even set sail. Maybe by the time they began to move further west, perhaps the survivors better understood the cultural expe- expectations of the people they were traveling with. We only have what the expedition recorded, and those who recorded such accounts definitely had motive to leave out some of their more unsavory actions. Now let's finish up with what happened to our four heroes starting with our narrator, Cabeza de Vaca. Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca would return to Spain, attempting to get the royal charter to go back and conquer Florida again. Apparently, he hadn't had enough yet. However, this had already gone to the De Soto expedition. Instead, in 1540, he would sail to the Rio de la Plata in South America to serve as governor. He marched across the mainland through unexplored territory to Asuncion instead of taking a ship, as was the common practice at the time. From there, he would lead an expedition to try and find this fabled golden city of Manoa and failed. Due to his policy of dismantling a system of abuses that could be taken against the natives, he fell victim to court intrigue and was sent back to Spain in chains in 1543. He was not tried until 1551, where he was sentenced to eight years in exile in Africa. His wife would spend much of her fortune fighting for him. Due to this, his sentence was eventually annulled, and he was placed on the audiencia. He died in honor in 1557. His further adventures would also be published with a co- and combined with his report of his time in Florida and the, what would become the American Southwest. Alonso de Castillo stayed in Mexico and married a wealthy widow. From here, he just completely drops out of the historical record. Andreas Dorantes was supposed to accompany Cabeza de Vaca to Spain, but after stopping off on the way, he would return to Mexico, possibly to begin organizing and recruiting for another expedition to the north. He would receive offers to go on the De Soto expedition, and maybe even to try to start with de Vaca. He would also marry a wealthy widow. He also may have been tapped to lead what would become the Coronado expedition. However, if he was, he refused it. As for Dorantes' slave Esteban, 
we will cover what happened to him during the next episode. Now that we at least briefly talked about Cabeza de Vaca and his overlap with New Mexico, I think it was almost five pages in total in my copy of his adventure, let's talk about why it was important. Cabeza de Vaca and his comrades were some of the first to see New Mexico in the American Southwest. They would serve as the inspiration for countless unofficial expeditions and several official expeditions, such as Fray Marcos de Niza, Francisco de Coronado, and several other later ones, such as the Chamuscado Dominguez expedition. Some of the tales they returned with were most definitely fantastical and would prove to be false or overblown. Some of them would seem to have some root in the historical record, just not with the civilizations or areas tied to them. But we'll begin talking about all of that and some of these expeditions in our next episode. If you enjoyed the show, please share it with your friends. Leave a review on your podcast app of choice if it lets you. Since I'm a Luddite and don't use social media, word of mouth and reviews are the only way the show spreads. We have a website located at engineeringfire.org. That's spelled E-N-G-I. N-E-E-R-I-N-G-F-I-R-E dot org, where I have a link in the header for podcast resources, including pictures, companion posts, my bibliography, and the transcripts of each show. We have an email you can submit comments and questions to at michael at engineeringfire.org. The intro music is Desperados by Frank Schroeder and sourced from filmmusic.io. The outro music is Neo Western from Kevin McLeod of Incompetech. Links to all things mentioned are present in the show notes and at the website. Thank you all so much for listening, and I will see you in the next episode.